Well, I guess we can get started. And is there anything we need to start off with, George? Or we just, um, I guess we don't um, really have any major updates, but. Um, yeah, I don't think I guess what we'll do is Jeff, can you give us give the audience a little bit of your background and your expertise in knife making and just, you know, just fill them in a little bit on what your background is. Okay, well, I, uh, my grandmother, my grandmother used to just give me knives when I was a little kid. So I've been playing with knives since I was little. And uh, I made my first knife in high school. And that was like, way too many years ago to say. And uh, I've been making uh, knives for about seven or eight years now, pretty uh, uh, professionally, you know, and um, uh, study martial arts and how they're used. I've gone to survival schools to learn how to use a knife in the wilderness and stuff like that. So, yeah. Okay, so, and as everybody knows, in Debbie's case, you know, she was stabbed to death. That's, that's the type or the, you know, the, the general manner of death that was used against her um, was a knife. So unfortunately, the, the few autopsy photos we have are just, they're just too gruesome. They're too, they're too gory to show. But um, obviously Jeff has seen a couple of them and that's how he was able to come to a lot of conclusions that he did. So Jeff, let's start off by you giving us a little insight on the blade profile, meaning Talk to us about the most likely style of blade that was on the knife used to stab Debbie. Well, the, the wounds look like it could be two different knives because uh, some wounds are uh, uh, indicate a double edged blade. The, the shallow ones that, you know, possibly hit the ribs and didn't go very deep. And then, but the, the deeper wounds look like uh, a possible single edge blade. Okay. And, and that makes it very, uh, very specific and, and not, not like a kitchen knife or other types of uh, fighting knives. Right. So, so I actually have one of my kitchen knives right here. I should show you. And so everybody's seen a knife like this. This is a single bladed knife, right? It only cuts on one side and the top is dull. So when Jeff says double edged blade, it's, Super sharp on both sides of the blade, right, Jeff? Right. Okay. It's, it's sharp on both sides. And then, uh, but whenever the, they went deeper, so uh, those, those blades went to a, a single edge type of knife. Uh, and we have a knife that uh, fits that profile. Do you have that with you? Yeah, I do, if you want to see it. Yeah, let's please see it. <laughs> Okay. It's show and tell tonight. <laughs> <laughs> this is it right here. Yep. You can see from, from here forward, it's a double-edged dagger style blade. And then from here back, it's a single-edged blade. Uh, but this, this bevel only goes up about halfway up the blade. And that's called a saber grind. And uh, it, some of the wounds that were shown would have a cross section that fits this section exactly and okay. it also has some wounds that fit this uh, this uh, cross section of the blade exactly so um this is a, a a likely contender for the the knife that was used now jeff how common is a knife like this just in general use i mean were we they they are very uncommon uh uh, you you don't see them used in in wilderness or anything. You don't see them used in the kitchen. They don't really cut vegetables well. Uh, they're mostly just made for stabbing. And uh, th this particular knife will cut because it was made as a knife. Uh, some of the more the later versions of the bayonets are not as sharp because they have a uh, a softer temper to the blade. So uh, this one was actually used as a knife, but there was about two and a half million of these made back in a little bit over a year during the war, World War II. And, um, and so nowadays there are a lot of uh, reproductions, but back then there wasn't as many copies as there are now. Gotcha. Um, I guess, Jeff, back then about, you know, like what, what type of soldiers or 
people who are in the military, who would have access to a knife like this? Well, uh, it was originally designed to be uh, used for uh, people who didn't have bayonets. So uh, I think uh, people who were issued M1 carbines and um, uh, various other uh, weapons like that. Uh, later on, they made uh, bayonets specifically for uh, those guns, but these were some of the first designs to come out uh, to be used as a knife, as a trench knife. I mean, would it be would it be a particular branch of the military? Uh, I would think it would be like the army, the army, and um, uh, you know they did the trench war warfare. I think so. more close quarters combat. <clears throat> right. Just being former army myself, we didn't we didn't get a, we didn't get knives like that. We did train with bayonets. I'm really not sure why because that's <laughs> something that we ever use at war. But we did train with them at basic training. But it was a completely different blade profile than what you're you're showing there. Ours was a much wider blade. Right. And I can't remember if it was double edged, but it wasn't very sharp, like you were right. saying. Yeah, so. like like I said, most bayonets are aren't sharp sharp because they're softer mm -hmm. and they wouldn't hold an edge for very long anyway. Uh, they're they're made soft so they won't break whenever you put them on okay. the end of a rifle. Okay. You know. And the so the style of knife that you're holding was there ever a bayonet type that had a blade like that, or was a knife like that ever outfitted where it could be attached to the end of a, a rifle? Yes. Yes, there were uh, there were four other variations after after this. Okay. Uh, yeah. The mostly the the main difference is the guard. It would have a bigger guard, something like this one, where you could put it around the barrel and have a, gotcha. an attachment yeah. point. Um, they they were fitted to uh, uh, rifles later. Okay, so before. The early 1940s, when that style of knife started to be made in bulk for the military, was there any other that could have been similar? Any other knife out there that was similar at all? Well, no, not not before. Uh, there were uh, there were trench knives back then, but they were double they were daggers. They were mm -hmm. double-edged blades. Some of them even had uh, brass knuckles on the handles. Oh. And, uh, yeah, so they were made for really close quarter fighting. But uh, 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 there was a, a German uh, version of this knife too, uh, later on, and it has a very similar profile to the blade. Okay, but by 1975, when Debbie was killed, I mean, they, millions of these have been made, correct? Right, right. And by including, then we have reproductions and- Including the, yeah, reproductions, bayonets, there was like tens of at least 10 million just wow. from just from the military. Okay. George, did you have something you were gonna ask? Yeah, I was gonna ask Jeff. So one of the things about Debbie's case that's kind of unique is that as far as we know from the evidence we've looked at, the blade did not break off in her body during the attack. Um, so these knives that you're talking about are as sturdy as they come. Would that be a a, a reach? Uh, no, that's that's very accurate. They would be very tough. to be made to be tough, um, and just hard enough to hold an edge without being brittle at all. Gotcha. And I mean, just so people, so we're clear, those knives are made for one thing, and that's killing humans, right? Right. Going through bone if it has to, and uh, you know, not breaking off. And you could put a lot of force on one of these knives and uh, still not break it off. How effective of a weapon is it? I would say it's very effective. It's uh, deep enough to get to uh, very vital parts of the body and sharp and and easy to cut with. Yeah. What's the width on that blade? Three quarters of an inch? Three quarters of an inch. Mm -hmm. And you think that's pretty consistent with Debbie's injuries? Yes. I mean, without anything, in the, in the pictures there wasn't anything to scale it by, but uh, it looked like it was pretty close to uh, this width. Yeah, from what we can tell from the few photos we have, it's, it appeared to be a pretty narrow blade. Yeah. Um, 
And to clarify, so you mentioned earlier that some of there, she has basically two different types of wounds, but those two different types of wounds could have been inflicted with the same knife, correct? It just exactly how same. deep the blade went in. Yeah, it just depends on how deep the blade went in. And uh, uh, there's very few knives with that profile. Yeah, okay. And so do you think this knife that was used, could it have been a re had a retractable blade or not? I don't think so, uh, because uh, number one, they were pretty thick. It, uh, this knife is a reproduction itself, and it's the uh, the originals were a little bit thicker than that. They were three sixteenths of an inch thick, and as you and as you see, the wounds are pretty pretty thick, and not just the width is narrow, but the thickness is there. That's true. And so uh, so uh, that would make it unwieldy in a pocket, like a retractable blade, like a switchblade, or just a lock back blade, or anything like that. Yeah. So it would, in order to protect yourself from slicing yourself open, it would have to be in some kind of a protective cover, right? Like a sheath. Right, a sheath, like this one. This is the sheath for it. Yeah. Has, and that's um, not something you're just gonna throw in your pocket. <laughs> no, no, it's it's pretty unwieldy. Yeah. Uh, it could be slid into a boot or it could be slid underneath a belt and, and hidden in that way it, it will fit on it will fit on a belt but mm -hmm. it's it flops around and yeah. it's uh it's very easy to spot yeah and how uh, i'll just real quick jeff um is there were there any common uses for these knives back in the 70s i mean obviously if they're made to kill people but were there any uses for these knives like um occupationally or anything like that possibly no no, not really. No, uh, you you could take one camping and and make a fuzzy stick to start a fire, and and the the pommel right here is flat, so you could drive a tent stake in with it. But that's a stretch, and uh, if you would you would have to be taking it just to do that, you know. So this is a weapon that you're going to use against another person, whether you're whether it be defending yourself or attacking. That's pretty much the only realistic use for this weapon. That's what it was designed for. Okay. So, what, in your opinion, if the you know Debbie's killer obviously walked on the property with this knife, right? So, does that, in your opinion, lend to some premeditation? Exactly. Yes. He he went there with the, at least the ideal that he may use it. Mm -hmm. but not expressly for that purpose. Yeah. And I guess, Jeff, along those lines, um, you know, we don't know for certain that the person who killed Deborah Sue was a male, but we just from what you've examined in this case, there are some pretty good indicators that the person who did this had to have some pretty good manual dexterity. Can you talk about that a little bit? Uh, yeah, he probably uh, was fairly strong, you know, like a, a young man would be maybe. And uh, uh, I think that like, if, if we consider like the first blow to be the blow to the head, cut the ear, uh, and likely whenever he come down, he hit, hit the shoulder to knock her down. Uh, that would take, you know, like a, nearly a full body uh, strength to do. Well, she's running away. Which would be less likely that a female could overpower her that quickly. Right. I mean, I think she would have been able to uh, fight back a little stronger. Yeah. What's your opinion on whether the killer might have cut their own hand through the course of this? Is, is the hilt or the protector on that knife pretty significant? On this specific knife, it's not huge. Mm -hmm. With the with the blood and the sweat, you can see that it kind of you can it can slip over. Okay. And um, so I I still think that this blade pr provides a pretty good uh, stop to the hand, but it could slip. And whenever whenever I've done this, whenever your hand slips over a blade like this, it instinctively scratches 
you know, you you grip it grip it harder, and uh, that causes it. Oh, uh, really? I didn't know that. <laughs> yeah, I, I've done it. <laughs> I've done it with knives that don't have a, a guard, and I was trying <laughs> to do something with a point, and I slipped, and it just ah. Uh, Interesting. I mean, I've cut myself so many times with a kitchen knife, but that's it. I've never um, <laughs> cut myself like with my hand slipping down a blade. So that's right. really interesting that you might grab it harder. Um, so what did Debbie's injuries indicate to you about the killer in terms of like what hand they probably were holding the knife in and what style of grip they were holding the knife in? Because there's more than one way to hold a knife. Yeah, there, there's uh, basically two ways. Uh, one is the the normal, normal a normal grip what somebody would use to cut carrots. So sometimes they use a pinch grip for that. But uh, uh, an ice pick grip, I think, is what was used in this uh, instance. Mm -hmm. uh, this this would uh, account for the overhead cut, cutting the ear, and also whenever she's down on the ground, you can see how. The, the wounds were vertical. Yeah. They didn't go in and out. It didn't cut. They didn't cut bigger than the knife, very much bigger than the knife. Uh, so if if she had been down on the ground and he been behind her, this type of grip would have been coming in at an angle. Yeah. Got, yeah. yeah. So I think it just about had to be like this. Yeah. And just to tell the audience, I mean, her injuries are pretty much, I guess, perpendicular, you'd say, to the surface of her skin. Right. Pretty close. There, there's not a lot of angle to most of them. Um, so yeah, I would agree with you. What hand do you think the killer was using to stab her? I think the right hand, right hand. because yeah, it cut her right ear as she was going away. Right. Yeah, yeah. And so there's one, there's one injury or slice wound to Debbie that's really was really peculiar to us before we talked to you, but that's the one to her left armpit. And it's, I mean, to tell the audience, it's it's a pretty gaping wound. I mean, it's, it's a few inches long. It's huge, right? What, first of all, there was you were telling me how the top and bottom edge indicated information about the blade profile, but also you had an interesting insight into why that one wound might have been so large. I think it got it got stuck between the between the ribs, uh, and very tightly. Like you can see how this point would wedge in between a, a cut pair of ribs, mm -hmm. and when it gets to this point and gets wider, it just wedges deeper. And uh, I think that he got the knife got wedged in there, and he had to use a considerable about considerable amount of force to get it in and out to try working it back and forth to make the wound it made the wound bigger and uh that was mostly just to try to get it back out yeah because you said you've seen situations where a knife was so embedded between two ribs that uh, uh, the the attacker actually drug moved the body by trying to get the knife dislodged right right it was stuck in so bad that they could move the body across the, the room with the knife handle yeah, that's something I had never thought of it's before amazing. we talked to you. It's amazing. It is. And so the top and the bottom of that armpit wound, the the cuts to the skin at the top and bottom of that wound are very sharp, right? Which right. Also they have a very sharp edge. Right? You, you can tell that it, that, that was the most definitive uh, double-edged wound. Okay. And I'm also, you know, the more I look at those photos and analyze it, I, I also think that was one of the most lethal injuries that she probably sustained. Right, because one of the things, like consider that where it got stuck in the ribs, that becomes a fulcrum. So yeah. at this point moves much, causes much more damage inside. Yeah, and your heart is there, your, your lungs potentially. Um, right. depending on the length of that blade. So that was probably one of the most lethal wounds that she um, yeah. incurred, unfortunately. I think so. Hey, Jeff, um, I actually have a question for you that I haven't, I don't think we've ever asked this question, Jennifer. So we can confidently say that it was a military style dagger produced in the 1940s. Now, someone who had a dagger like that, how would they be a, 
how would they be trained to attack a body or attack a person? I mean, would you expect that, would you expect wounds to be in certain parts of the body necessarily if they were trained to use the dagger? I guess what I'm getting at is, is that, is this a, does this seem sophisticated to you or does this seem frenzied to you? Like somebody who had the knife, but maybe was never trained to use it. I think it was someone that was never trained to use it. Uh, mostly because uh, you, you're taught targeting mm -hmm. and uh, uh, like some of the lower down wounds are not really uh, where they might be intentionally made to be lethal. He's just stabbing. And I think it's more frenzied than uh, thoughtful. Yeah. I mean, I don't, I have no idea how the military was trained to use that weapon back when they were issued. That's actually something we should probably look up or maybe somebody in our Facebook group knows. But the way that Debbie was stabbed, it's just, I mean, it was effective, but there was a great possibility that it wasn't going to be overly effective and that, she, you know, she could have put up a much longer fight. I mean, there, even though they went for vital organs, none of them were immediately lethal. Right. No, none of them were. <clears throat> and, you know, we, George and I have always wondered, you know, why didn't the person just pull an OJ and slice her throat? I mean, yep. that would be the most effective way, I would think, to take her out. Yeah. But it's also one of the uh, messiest ways as well. True. Because <laughs> <laughs> the main. Yeah. The arteries are closer to the surface there. Yeah. Of course, I guess if you're there to stab her and kill her and you're in such close proximity to her anyway, you're probably not worried about that aspect anyway, because no matter how much blood got on the killer, a significant amount got on them and there was a significant amount of blood. So that probably wasn't a consideration. Probably um, not. So this, so in your opinion, this looks like an amateur, I hate to use the term, but just amateurish attack, I guess. It's not somebody who's use this knife in any uh, like like meaningful way. Like they probably weren't in the military trained with this knife. Correct, right. Okay. And we got into this last week a little bit with our criminalists, but some of Debbie's wounds are um, in a horizontal manner. Well, right. okay, a majority are vertical, but there's several that are horizontal. And I mean, we, we obviously don't know the for sure the correct answer as to why that is, but it was proposed last week that the horizontal injuries were actually inflicted after her body was moved and the killer was to the left or right side of her, which is right. something I really hadn't thought of. I don't, I don't know what your thoughts are on that. I've thought of that since uh, I heard y'all talking about it before and uh, consider this. I know that it was a very narrow space there. And, and the killer was more vertical and she was laying on the ground, but she was beside a car. So, uh, and she may have been using her legs to push away from the guy. So, uh, um, sorry, you just came over on Facebook. Uh, so uh, <laughs> I forgot to turn off my thing and I didn't know how to do it now. But anyway, <laughs> uh, um, so she was next to the car, but she's flat on the ground. So. There's space underneath the car that she could have turned enough to, like oh, her head yeah. have went under the car a little bit. And she probably could have got completely uh, perpendicular. That's a good thought. You know, uh, whenever she, and the, the, the main wound underneath the armpit is at a diagonal. It's like a mm -hmm. 45 degree angle from the other. You know, you have you have the vertical ones and the horizontal ones, but the one in the armpit That's is the true. angle. So that could have been where she she's turning, and she would have had to have her arm up to get that wound for, in there for like leverage or something. Yeah, right. Trying to just stop them from uh, you know stabbing, you know, slow it right. down or something, you know. And so I think it, that the knife came into the ribs at a forty-five degree angle. And that would make sense why it got stuck. <laughs> Yeah, right. At that angle, yeah, right. that make a lot of sense. George was brought this up to me the other day about when a victim is encountering a knife attack from the front. A lot of times they'll just try to actually grab the blade. It seems counterintuitive, right? But is it not? Is that a normal gut reaction? Yeah, that's that's normal. 
even whenever someone is like uh, going to get shot, they'll put a hand up and there'll often be a gunshot wound through the hand mm -hmm. or the arm, you know, just to like, no. And as, I mean, as far as we know, there's, I don't have any photos of her hands, but there's no description in the autopsy report saying that she had cuts to her, to the palms of her hands. Right. So, I mean, she does have some defensive injuries, but that one is not, doesn't appear that she had the opportunity or it was a, she had a different gut instinct maybe than to grab that blade, but that doesn't appear to have happened. Yeah, I, I don't think she could have grabbed the blade so much as, as just trying to put something back there to, uh, stop it you know because mm -hmm. uh, you can see it anyway Th this knife is black and uh, it's moving fast in That's the dark true. yeah it's pitch black it's pitch black right. she, she wouldn't have been able to see it she was just trying to get something in the way yeah i like the point you brought up about maybe she was able to get herself at least partly under the car turned someone like i really hadn't thought of that but yeah that's a good thought well, these cars are were taller, uh, mm -hmm. had more ground clearance than they do nowadays, so. Yeah. So Jeff, I guess, based on what you've looked at in this case and the conversations you've had with Jennifer and I, um, what's your theory of how Debbie was attacked from beginning to end? Well, uh, I, I consider this, one of the things that is puzzling is why the, the main door is left open and so I, I think that maybe he uh, approached her right at the door and maybe grabbed her and she pulled away. And when she did, the screen door shut. And so she decided rather than try to go back inside to take off. And then he came, he tried to catch her. And uh, as he's reaching for her, that's when the, the knife was start coming down like this, cuts her ear, maybe her cheek as well and knocks her to the ground and then stab, stab, stab. And then she starts to try to turn, maybe try to turn to face him. And uh, that's uh, my consideration right there. I, I don't know about any of the wounds that went to the front of her body. You know, I couldn't see any of those, uh, but- um, There's no good photos of them. <laughs> oh yeah. <laughs> I, I saw your drawing and I saw the, just like a couple you know, maybe. Yeah. Maybe trying to get it just to finish, you know. Right. And for the audience, I will upload that sketch to our Facebook group later. Um, but know that we do not have a photo of every single injury that's described in the autopsy report. So grain of salt, especially with the ones to Debbie's front side. We do have a good photo of the wounds to her back. So my sketch on the back side is pretty accurate. Same with her cheek, but there's no photo of the other wounds to her scalp or her ear. And the couple of her front are really poor other than that big armpit gash. So grain of salt <laughs> on some of those injuries. And when I do post that, like feel free to make comments and I can clarify which injuries I had to sketch just based off a written report. Um, but we will upload that because I, I thought that was pretty instructive to recreate that sketch. <laughs> and it was. Just, I just didn't realize how significant the number of wounds to her backside were, but there's a lot. Yeah. Agreed. Yeah. I remember George and I were like, wow, it's that, that's just one of those things where to make a visual aid, just, yeah. it, it just opens your mind, you know? When you, when you sent it to me, I remember thinking before that it, we were giving like equal credence to the injuries to the front and back. We knew there yeah. was more to the back, obviously. But when you saw, when you created that diagram, it changed everything for me. I, that's when I immediately became of the opinion that she probably didn't fight back much, that she was on her front side. Her front side was on the ground while the attack was happening. And she had, she was hit, you know, whether she was knocked unconscious, semi-unconscious, whether she was in shock from her ear getting cut from the initial blow, whatever caused her senses to go out. And seeing that diagram, I was like, okay, that makes a lot more sense. Jeff, one interesting thing that you did at my house when you came um, a few months ago is you showed, while that knife is very unwieldy in your pocket, it's unwieldy to, to use, it's actually pretty easy to conceal if you're confronting someone 
Could you show right. us exactly how you can conceal that along your forearm? Yeah. Um, let's see if I can. Like right here. Mm -hmm. You can't hardly see it at all. No. And uh, if you're in the dark and you got it beside your hand, beside your. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. It's, it's, it's impossible to see until they want you to right. see it. Yeah. And could be doing that just to just in case somebody comes by you know or or if he wanted to talk to her or ask her a question or something beforehand or whatever i don't know but uh uh it's it's very easy to conceal and not only is it concealed but it's at the ready i mean it in is a half a it's, second it's in the it's, proper position to use it it's in it's in the uh it's in the grip like you can like yeah turn it this way, but you can see that there's a yeah. pool right there. Yeah, and it's it's not like, oh, I got to take a second to open the blade on my switchblade or pocket knife or something like that. I mean, it's, it's right. ready there's, to go. And... There's a lot of people in the self-defense world that says, you know, uh, a, uh, a a knife to use for self-defense is a broken knife, you know, a, a pocket knife, because you had to take it out, fix it, and then use it. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. <laughs> and by then your victim is two seconds ahead of you, which can be right. make all the difference in the world. Right. But I mean, now that I even think that through more, there's a good chance that a killer that that's how they were holding it because unfortunately Debbie didn't make it very far. No. Um, so it appears that the person was pretty much ready to use a weapon when they arrived there. Right. And again, premeditation. Exactly. Um, I'll share my screen real quick and show the sketch for everybody again. So like I said, um, these ones here, the backside, those are accurate. And that's, I, I tried to replicate the shape of the wound as best I could there. The two on her left arm, I went off the written description. They said upper lateral left arm. So that's okay. the outer left arm, but I don't know exactly where on the left arm those two are. Right. Same goes, we know that we have a picture of the armpit wound. I do not have a good picture of these two to the front side. And same, like I said, for the scalp, um, the only picture we have is of her cheek. So again, I had to go off the written description of the location of these two to the right side and back of her scalp. Right. Um, hey, hey, Jeff, just a quick question. Um, I know your expertise is more with knives. One theory that we've had that we've kind of kicked around is that maybe the back hoe that we're not back. I said it again, Jennifer. <laughs> I just said it. The garden the hoe. Back hoe on the property, just so everybody yeah. knows. <laughs> I guess it would have been easier just to run her over than use the whatever. <laughs> yeah. But um, the garden hoe, we we we, and this is just a theory that we've just kicked around. Just it. It doesn't make any sense, but it could make sense when you look at some of the other like forensic evidence at the scene. Is it possible, in your opinion, that maybe the killer could have grabbed the? We know that that garden hoe was sitting next to the door in proximity. Is it possible that the killer grabbed it and just hit her, and maybe that explains that slash mark? Like if they used the sharp end, right, the working end of it, hit her in the head, knocked her out. She's laying on the ground, and then the person's like, I got to finish her off. And they have this type of a knife maybe sitting under their the floorboard of their car, you know, like under the front seat of their car, using, you know, maybe they had it as protection. Then they come and grab the knife, and then they just decide to end it like that. And the reason we say that is, is because it looks like the, the, the garden hoe got caught up in the window and the screen, and it, it's just kind of like maybe in the swinging motion, maybe it got caught. Do you have any thought, I mean, about that? Anything's possible. And, uh, uh, you know, it, I, I, I don't think, I don't understand why he would uh, use, use the hoe if he brought the knife with him. But like you said, if he left it in the car, uh, mm -hmm. that is a possibility. Uh, uh, it's hard to switch weapons once you started, started something. Uh, yeah. You just have a single-minded focus, and uh, it could it could be difficult to switch weapons. Uh, but like you said, if he had time, if he did knock her out, and that would be the only only 
yeah. chance it would be that he had had time to go do something else. That's Got true. It. And we know it's rare. I mean, it's very rare for a killer to use two weapons at a scene. Um, yeah. Just don't want to discount any possibility. But also, we just that that window being broken out is so weird. I mean, if you see this window, Jeff, I think you and I talked about it when you were here. Yeah. It's just, it even for if this was some, you know, 18, 19, 20, 21 year old, you know, uh, killer. It's so amateurish. It's so sophomoric. I mean, there's just, it makes no sense at all. No one would have believed that anybody was going to crawl through that window. So right. it's almost like it was a mistake. Like he was swinging that thing around and it just got caught in there. And um, so anyway, we were just curious. And also the slash mark to her face is just an interesting wound because of the fact it's so out of place in a way because there's no other wounds to her face. So obviously that wound was, we feel like a, I guess the term gen mistake. I mean, like it wasn't intended. Yeah, so. no, I don't think so. It's and it is. A, it's a big slash. It's not a. Um, a yeah, it's not slash. a penetrating. Not exactly. a penetrating wound. Right. Yeah, it's very different. Very very different from all the other wounds. Right. And it did bleed, but it's not. It does. It looks fairly superficial. It doesn't look really deep. So. But it's something we're still working on. I would love to brainstorm with people about is <laughs> yeah. how, how that how that injury came to be because that might be a huge clue as to how this whole thing went down. Because um, I, I agree with Jeff, that was probably one of the first injuries. Right? Yeah, I, I have no doubt about that. Yeah, if they wanted to destroy her face, they had every opportunity to do that, and that wasn't done. So, exactly. yeah, I do think it's kind of like the person missed their mark somehow. Mm -hmm. Um, George, you got any? You got anything else? Um, no. Anything on our um, list. I think Jeff addressed everything, and then we've got some questions in the yeah. queue. Pull those up. Um, I, uh, it, I'm I hope I'm pronouncing her name right. Yvonne Bergay. There was a local woman that had a store that sold military knives and such. So he could have purchased it there, or he could have had a grandfather, father hand it down to him. So I guess that was just a comment. Mm -hmm. Agreed. Um, yeah. Let's see here. Um, okay. So whoa. Can okay. Here's one from owner. Can you handle this kind of knife easily while wearing gloves? Yes. I think it. I think it was probably designed to be handled, uh, used with gloves because uh, the handle is pretty, uh, fairly small. If, you, if you're gonna use gloves, you don't want a big handle and uh, it's slightly oval. So you can tell which way the, the edge is facing, even with gloves on and, and these, these uh, indentations, it could, could definitely be used with gloves. Okay. Somebody asked how much the knife weighs. No Ooh, way. <laughs> I, I don't know right offhand. I think it's about nine ounces or so. Less than a pound. Yeah, it's less not, than a pound. Not overly heavy. Okay. No, it's not heavy. Okay. Um, there was one comment up above that, Jen. It was just after the murder, did anyone in her circle have hand injuries um, or hand surgery? As far as we know, um, no, we don't have any information about that. Obviously, if the if anybody in the circle or anybody that was a suspect or interviewed had those type of injuries, I think that would have been an alarm bell for police, and we would have seen more evidence of it, like in media reports and things like that. So, <coughs> so I'd say no on that. Amber also made a comment and question about this type of dagger knife was common among World War II veterans although vets at the time would have been in their 50s. Also, the wounds appear to be from someone unexperienced in killing. Totally agree. Um, yeah. So perhaps the son of a World War II veteran, does anyone in Debbie's circle fit that description? Several. Many. <laughs> yeah, several. <laughs> yeah, actually, a lot of the dads from that era had to serve in World War II. Um, yeah. So yes, there are many that fit that. Um, any police reports of a stolen knife around the time? Not that we've uncovered. Um, there were several knives that were turned over to police over the course of months. Um, one was found like 
on an off ramp of a highway or something like, you know, something random like that. One was found in a field in Debbie's neighborhood, I think. Um, there was a few others, but ultimately none of them matched the blade profile or tested positive for blood. So we have no idea where the murder weapon actually went to, um, but it could still be out there. Yeah. Yep. Uh, Deborah Lewis actually had a good question. Uh, Jeff, were there belts issued with these knives and were they like, was it was a type of belt issued with this knife? There, there was a belt. It was called the, uh, the the pistol belt. It was like a two inch wide webbing that had eyelets in it, and uh, you could you could put a pistol, a magazine holder, um, and a uh, they had attachment points like this mm -hmm. that they would they would slide into the eyelets on the belt. There were canteen holders and stuff like that, and uh, uh, but you could also you know you could also just slide a regular belt through as well if you didn't have if you didn't want to use it because it's really floppy those pistol belts were floppy and uh not super well designed they were they were they were uh they were strong and durable but uh not fun to wear because i i got one when i was a kid to uh carry my carry a canteen with me and uh i got rid of it pretty soon <laughs> Yeah, we got issued those in basic training too. Those those pistol belts, and you had to put all your stuff on them. <laughs> I mean, yeah, they they are garbage. I think in my opinion, the only it would be useful if you got stuck on a cliff or something, and you had this two inch webbed belt to help climb, you know, help yourself climb up on a cliff or something. But beyond that, it's like repel seat. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Like you said, not the most useful thing in the world, and and just kind of um, clunky. You know, it wasn't something you'd you'd wear out on the street or whatever right, but like you yeah. said you can you can put that sheath on any belt so yeah um annette asked jeff do you think there could have been two people stabbing her uh well with the confines with the confines of the area probably not uh it had to be one from the head and one from the back if there was two um i i i don't think that would be a likely scenario. And Jeff, just to follow up on that question, the knife that you that you showed us um, could make every single wound that you saw on her body. So it's not like there's two different knives as far as like the depths are, you know, pretty consistent. The widths are pretty consistent. So it doesn't look like there's two different types of weapons. No, no, just one weapon. And uh, it can make the different type of hole, basically. Uh, just by the depth of the blade, how deep it went into. And uh, Deborah asked another question: um, Is there a possibility that Debbie grabbed the garden hoe to defend herself? We we have tossed that around. We've, we've discussed that idea at length, wondering if she had the opportunity to grab it, and then obviously it was taken away from her, and maybe she swung it, you know, and that's what. And it got caught it. in the window. I yeah. mean, and then she just turned around and took off running because it got yeah. caught and that was it. I mean, that very well could explain yeah. the weird, you yeah. know. The only, the thing about the garden hoe though is it was found on top of the bloody drag marks. Right. And that so doesn't mean that he didn't like, use it, but it means it was put there after she was moved. Right. Well, you know, the thing of it is I've got it hung up in the window it may have stood out like a sore thumb, like the person might have thought, man, somebody driving by sees a, you know, a garden hoe, you know, and they just got nervous and pulled it out and it just dropped on the ground as they left. But that could be a very good answer for why that weirdo broken glass is there. Yep. Yeah, it is it's peculiar. Um, could the cheek have been, and this is Amber again, could the cheek have been injured as a result of a stabbing to her ear? And that's for you, Jeff. Uh, I think so. I, I think that uh, if, you, if you look, the, the, the tip of the blade could have yeah. scratched down there, could have scratched down the cheek, uh, as, especially as the arm hit the shoulder. It could turn the blade up slightly. And it's, I think it's entirely possible. Yeah, that makes sense. Yeah, just seeing you do that just really does make a lot of sense. Yeah. So I'm, I'm, I'm starting to move away from my 
Not my backhoe. Back my, back <laughs> my garden <It's> backhoe. <laughs> <It's the> <laughs> okay, was the garden hoe tested for blood? Uh, we know it was um, dusted for fingerprints. Uh, I'm trying to remember, George, if there's any verbiage about whether the blade of it was tested for blood. Do you remember? I don't remember, but I, okay. I remember you and I felt that there was some that we didn't have the complete information oh, yeah. on that. We just we don't know. Yeah. We hope we hope there's a we hope there's some blood sitting in a, a you know, and, and it sounds crazy, but you guys are all very well aware. There are lots of cases. There were a couple of cases here recently from the 70s where they found one little bit of biological evidence that they were able to test. And so. Hopefully, you never know. There could be one little thing sitting in a, a an evidence bag somewhere that they're testing. May have already tested as we're sitting here speaking. Yeah, and we're just hoping and praying, but we don't have enough information to intelligently speak on that front. I'm gonna go over to the chat because there's a couple things in here. Um, uh, could the killer have broken the window to get her to come outside and see what happened? I would say that's a valid theory other than she came out with her purse keys and puzzle book. And I think if she was coming out to find the source of, you know, hearing broken glass, she wouldn't collect her items and then go towards this potential threat. Um, so I, I don't tend to think that the broken window was like a ruse to try to get her to come outside. Yeah, and, and also, Jen, I would also think that the, her first move would be to get get on the phone. Yeah, that that would be. Yeah. It, 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 I think that most. It, it, we're talking 1975 Lubbock, Texas. Most females, if somebody breaks out a window, and she was scared to death of the dark. We know that. Yeah, she hated oh, the she, dark. She was scared of it. Yeah. So, and if she was going to go out any door, if you know, like I've got a window here, if it gets busted out and I see somebody climbing in or coming at me, I'm going that way. You know, mm -hmm. so she would have went out the other door to go try to find help. Yeah. So that would be my guess. Okay, and then if the hoe broke the window in initial attack, wouldn't the glass be under the majority of blood rather than on top? Again, we only have a written statement that's a couple sentences long about the location of the glass from the window, and we don't have a good photo. Um, they did say glass was found on top of blood, but keep in mind that bricks and concrete are very porous. So blood will soak into them very quickly. And that could, they also they're rough surfaces, whereas glass is perfectly flat, right? So by the time the glass gets broken and falls on the bricks, it's possible the blood had soaked down into that porous surface. And that's why it didn't get on the underside of the glass. But Again, we are missing, you know, I don't want to say significant portions of this case file, but we are definitely missing some portions of this case file that have more description and photos. And so it's just one of those challenges with such an old case um, that we, we, don't, we don't have all the answers yet. So I would take that report of the glass completely being on top of blood um, with a grain of salt because we, we don't have a visual aid to, to back up that claim. Anybody else? I think, did we get everybody's questions? I think we did. Did we miss any? If we did, just, just ask yeah. it again and we'll ask it real quick while Jeff is here. Anna, do you wanna actually speak? Oh no, never mind. <laughs> Someone accidentally raised their hand. Okay, Jim. Well, I guess uh, we'll just tell everybody next week we plan on doing, um, we want to do some Q&A, a lot of Q&A next week, but what we're going to do is we're going to kind of outline exactly what our, what we think is pretty provable at this point in this case. There are some things that are, nothing's definitive, but some, some things are pretty definite at this point. And so what we're going to do is we're going to go do a rundown of what we think, where we think the evidence is at, the theories, all that kind of thing. And then we want to get into a Q&A with you guys just to brainstorm, you know, different ideas and different questions and all that. So basically, it'll be a, a rundown of everything we're going to, that we've learned up to this point with you guys. And then um, 
we'll probably talk about some other stuff that we're going to plan on doing yeah. later down the road and in a few weeks. So, and I think I'll check with Andy, who's my wonderful editor, who's hosting this for us tonight. I think next week's format is going to be slightly different where we're going to just make it a zoom meeting and that way um, everybody you don't have to have your video on but you'll be able to if you want to but it'll be a little easier for us to have a discussion because we yeah. i would prefer to call it more of a discussion than just q a because there's some topics like we would like to get feedback on from you guys next week so if people are willing you know to get on and actually speak and discuss things with us we would love that but you don't have to <laughs> but we yeah. just we want to make that an option for next week so bring any questions ideas you have we'll do our best to answer whatever questions you bring up as you know we don't have the answer to everything but um, we're happy to discuss about any topic related to this case and like george said we'll we're going to kind of i guess i guess kind of sum things up in terms of where we are as of next tuesday on the case Absolutely. Jeff, thank you so much for joining us. It was fascinating. The comments we're getting in right now, everybody talking about what a great session this was, and we very much appreciate you. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Anytime. Anytime thank you need me. Thank you so much. <laughs> Don't yeah. worry, we'll be calling you again, trust me. Yep. Okay. <laughs> I was just going to say that. <laughs>